Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Fargo. We are so glad that you are here worshiping with us. Uh, please stand as we prepare our hearts for worship. Um, I just pray that whatever burden you came in with today, that you are able to leave it today at the foot of the cross, that you're able to just cast it down and really worship, seeking after the Holy Spirit, seeking after Jesus Christ, seeking after God the Father, and really just spending time in their presence. From Isaiah chapter 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's trust in that Lord today and worship him. This is what happens in live music, see? Oops. Turn off. No. Okay.
morning, Calvary family. We are so excited to have you here at Calvary Fargo this morning. So excited to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome by those who are joining us by virtual campus. And good morning to the balcony bunch up there. How are you guys doing this morning? Yes, they're doing great. So that's always outstanding. This is the part of the service where we just take some time between us and the Lord to um, settle any things that might have come up. You know, sometimes mornings are frustrating and sometimes you can get a little bit off kilter, get kind of uh, out of the way and not really focused on Christ. So this is a moment where we can take the focus on Christ, confess any sins that are, be are between us and the Lord, and then confess those sins both individually and then corporately so that we can worship freely. So as the confession comes up, I will read what is in the white text and you will read what's in the yellow bold. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment of silent reflection between you and the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. And we, and we humbly repent. repent. For, For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Christ have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. This morning, if you have confessed that in faith, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ is just to forgive us. So receive forgiveness in the name of our Lord. And with that, let us continue in worship.
So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle, nothing can stand against the power of our God. And Almighty Fortress, you go before us, nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win.
amen, amen. Father God, we know that there are battles going on, supernatural battles that we don't even see, that there are angels fighting on our behalf. Angels, you have sent to protect us against the dark forces of this world. And Father God, that is amazing that you would fight our battles for us. And sometimes we forget because we can't see it. But what an honor it is to know that you have said each person needs their angels to fight their battles. We are never alone in our battles, Lord. And honestly, it lifts a burden to remind me that I am not alone in my suffering. I'm not alone in my grief. I'm not alone because there are angels battling. And frankly, that is reason to praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing goes, nothing happens without you seeing or without you knowing. It's nothing is a surprise to you, Lord. So let us fall on our knees with our hands lifted high and praise. Hallelujah. What a great God you are, that you are concerned about us from the smallest things to the largest things, that you are in control of everything and that you love us so much that you want to fight our battles for us and be alongside us. And God, the battle belongs to you. I pray that we can find rest in that. I pray that we can find peace in that. And I pray that we can find joy in the promises of our great God. Hallelujah and amen. Amen. We are so glad that you are here with us today worshiping. Please greet one another in the name of Jesus. Before you lead us into uh, the Apostles' Creed and before he leads us into the scripture reading, I just really felt something in the spirit when we talked about the battle belongs to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And there come moments in our lives when we have to just really press in and understand what God is doing. And so this is one of those moments uh, when Lindsay talked about there are battles that are happening. There are always battles that are happening. Now, sometimes the pastor gets to learn about them because they say, Pastor, come and talk to me. Tell me, you know, this is what I'm going through. But sometimes they don't say anything. And then in church culture where they tell us to put on the great face because you're not supposed to ever go through anything, Rob. Yep. You're not supposed to ever face anything, Blake. It can become easy to just do church, good church as it is. There's nothing wrong with good church. But how many are desiring something better than just coming for good church? How about breakthrough? How about shackles being broken? How about walls being torn down? How about God irrevocably changing the lives of people who are hurting, marriages that are struggling, families that are wrestling? And God can bring healing. So I'm just going to ask them to go back into the course. And if you so feel, I'm going to invite you to stand. And when the course says, with my hands lifted high, you stretch them out to the God you know that can change everything. So when I find
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Join me with the, uh, with the Apostles' Creed. With the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ his only Son, Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, Pilate, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Hence shall judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading start with Luke 4, 5 through 8. The devil led him in a high place and showed him in an instant of the king, all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all authority and splendor that has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. John 18, 33 through 36. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summons Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others tell you about me? I am a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people, the chief priests, handed it over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. By now, the kingdom is from another place. Mark 
13 through 17, paying the imperial tax to Caesar. Later, they sent some Pharisees and um, he, or here it ends to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came and asked him and said, Teacher, you know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of the God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or should we? shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he said. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and asked him, whose image is on it and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may have your seats. So this Sunday, we're continuing in our series, Unashamed. Last week, we talked about being unashamed of the Bible, being unashamed of the Bible. And why that was very significant, why we talked about why it's important to be unashamed of the Bible is because today, we're going to be talking about a biblical worldview. And in order to have a biblical worldview, you got to have some understanding of what the Bible means to you what it means for your life, how you read it, how you interpret it, how you position it, because all of that will determine what kind of authority the Bible will have in your life, and that will affect your biblical worldview. So let me share with you a little bit of this. Uh, A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, I know the Star Wars fans said, finally, we get some love, man. You know, Star Trek yesterday, so, yeah. Today you get a little bit of love, but there was this king who lived in this galaxy far, far away. Omnipotent king was the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Before all things was, he existed. And so he decided to create the heavens and the earth. Amongst those, he created what some people call the sons of God, the sons of God which are the angels, ranks of angels. And so they have this hierarchy. They have their different roles and responsibilities. And all these divine beings created by God. And God says, I am king. But one day, one of these individuals, they said, hmm, that's a mighty fine looking throne you got up there, God. It's got a lot of gold, it's got a lot of jewels, and I love the fact that people are singing around you day and night talking about how great you are. I would like to experience some of that. And so he went around, you know. Uh, Not that this happens here in the human world, but it kind of happens in the angelic world occasionally. So he went around talking to people, saying, do you think God, you know, this king, you think he's really that great of a king? And, you know, if you vote for me, um, I think I'd make a better king, and I'll hook you up with a nice cabinet position. And so by the time he finished running around, he had about one-third of all the heavenly hosts on his agenda before the war broke out and a third of the heaven was cast out. And all of that was because of this idea of kingdom. Every kingdom, heavenly kingdom, earthly kingdom, functions off of this concept, worship. We don't usually connect the two, but we're going to be connecting the two today because in having a biblical world of kingdom, once you have a biblical world view of kingdom, you can understand everything that's going on in politics, everything that's going on in social society, everything that's going on in your family life, everything going on in your spiritual life because kingdoms is really a term for what is now for many of us as Christians spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 4. This is going to be our primary text where we're going to spend some time in, kind of laying out the structure of kingdom, how kingdom is operating, and then the other two passages are just some icing on the cake. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And if you have it, are you reasonably close? Say amen. All right, it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days 
he was tempted by the devil. Side note, who led Jesus into the wilderness? The spirit. Not everything that you go into that's uncomfortable, uh, that challenges you, or sends you to a place that you may not want to go, or puts you in a job that you may not want to be in, so forth and so forth. Everything is not the devil attacking you. Sometimes that's the spirit taking us into a place so he can develop us. So what is the difference between uh, testing and tempting? Because God does not tempt, the Bible says, but God does test. Testing is for your assessment because God is trying to develop you. Tempting is for your destruction because Satan is trying to destroy you. So he was sent in there to be tested, tempted by the devil. And it says he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So our source, like we talked about last week with the word of God, our source is found in God in his word. Now, this is where we're going to spend our time. Verse number five, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. He said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Then Jesus says, it is written, worship the Lord your God only and serve him only. I want you to look at verse number five, because verse number five gives us the structure, gives us the structure of kingdom. It says, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And so in any organization, in any kingdom, there is a leader. There is some kind of unifying place or unifying purpose. And then there is some sort of vision or goal that the organization or the kingdom or the country is trying to ultimately meet. So there is a leader, there's a unifying uh, purpose, and then there's a vision. That's kind of how the structure of all kingdoms and organizations work. Those are the components you're going to find in all organizations, all kingdoms, all government. That's what kind of drives them. And so we see that in verse 5. Uh, we're seeing this. Now, this also applies in the heavenly kingdom also. This example just has to show the devil as the leader. But when God is the leader, it's the same thing. God surrounds us in a unifying place. He gives us a vision because the word says, without vision, the people perish. Now, that is the structure of kingdoms. The agenda of kingdoms using that same verse is the devil, uh, kingdoms need a leader. The devil wants to have rule and authority. God also wants to have rule and authority. And the devil leads him to a high place. We're going to stop right there. The devil takes him and takes him to a high place. Why does the devil choose a high place? If we go back into the Old Testament, we discover that the high places are the places of worship. Usually a lot of false gods in the high places is when they do the false worship, but they would go to the high places. So the devil is very strategic. The devil says, if I'm going to tempt Jesus in this way, I'm going to take him to a place where people are kind of used to worship. And then he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. The kingdoms of the world represented desire, imagination, and for us today, that really shows up in media. How many times do you watch a commercial and it says, if you just had this, you would be so much better. If you buy this product, you're going to be so much flashier. If you do this, people are going to love you more. Buy our product, buy our product, be this, be that. And they're trying to get you to buy into an image and imagination so that you will gravitate towards it and you will take your eyes off God who has created you beautifully and wonderfully made to focus on something else that has nothing to do with the kingdom or God's purpose for your life. They want you to worship a false image or a false God. And so he offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. When it comes to a biblical worldview of kingdom, here's what you need to understand. Where you spend your time informs what you worship. 
Where you spend your time informs what you worship. Fun fact. How many know that six, corporation, six corporations control 90% of all the U.S. media? Six corporations control the various news channels, entertainment channels. They control all of that media. So if you've ever really paid attention, you'll notice that you can go from one channel and they'll say this, and you can go to another news program and they're saying exactly the same thing to another entertainment program that's saying exactly the same thing because they have their own agenda, their own gospel that they want to teach you. And so they're trying to indoctrinate you with their point of view. And here it is. It doesn't matter where you land on the political spectrum on this or the social spectrum on this. This is about generating money. You have to keep that in focus. The God of this world, a lot of times, is the God called money, God called success, God called fame. And 90% of the media spend multiple millions of dollars to understand how to get your dollar out of your pocket so that they can sell you a false God and idol. 6% of the corporations control 90% of the media. Then it says in Luke uh, verse 6, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor because it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. Why does Jesus, I mean, why does the devil offer Jesus all authority and splendor? Point number two, Satan taps into the emotional vacuums, felt needs, and desires in order to seduce you. Satan will use your emotional vacuums, your felt needs, and your desires in order to seduce you to his way of living. That's what those commercials, that's what that is all about. How can I convince you that you're not good enough, that you need something else, that you're lacking in some way in order to purchase a product? And so Satan has been using this tactic for years. He used it in the garden with Eve. He said, did God really say no, 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 no. Look, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. Except here's the thing. God created them in his image so they were already like God. So Satan always come to convince you you need something you really don't need. And so he does it with Jesus also. He says, you know what, Jesus? Remember when you came down, like in Philippians 2, you emptied yourself out. And now you don't have the authority of heaven. But you know what? I got some authority here on earth. You know, you've been in this desert, you know, like almost 40 days and you haven't had anything to eat. I've got some food for you. You know, there are people who are doubting that you are actually the son of God. So, look, if you jump off of this uh, high tower right now and survive, people will believe that you're really the son of God. Satan always brings to us those things that are vacuums in our life, emotional vacuums, felt needs, and desires. And if we don't check those, he'll use those against us, which is why we have to be filled up on the word of God. So verse number seven, it says, if you worship me, it will all be yours. In your bulletin, there's a question that asks, why does Satan want your worship? You ever wonder that? Satan comes to him. Satan has his own kingdom. Satan has dominion over the earth. And what he does, he says to Jesus, hey, look, you know, I'll give you all this stuff if you would just worship me. You just give me a little bit of worship. Well, I mean, it's not a big deal, you know, uh, just a quick bow, say I'm pretty cool, I'm pretty great, get back up, and hey, it didn't cost you anything whatsoever. In order to understand why Satan is asking this, we have to understand what worship is. Being Dictionary defines worship as this, the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. The feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. The verb says to treat someone or something with the reverence or adoration appropriate to a deity. Now, here's where I have to say some hard stuff. Is it all right if I say some hard stuff? If I can say some hard stuff, say, say it, preacher. All right. I got to say some hard stuff today. The reason you see the culture you see right now in our nation 
It's because people have given adoration and reverence to whatever it is they desire as if it's a deity. For some of us, that's politics. For some of us, that's a certain social position. For some of us, that's the way we view the world. And there's a lot of other fights out there. And it's not to say that you can't have a position on something. But do you hold that position to the point that you are willing to uh, tear down your brother or sister that's in the Lord with you? Are you willing to tear down your brother or sister in order to make your point, to have your position in order to be right? Are you willing to call them out of their name, say they're this, that, and some other labels that we love to throw on people? Are you willing to do all of that? Because here's the thing, if you react violently to somebody just saying a couple of words or asking a question about something that doesn't agree with what you believe, no matter where you land on any area of part of life, you may have an idol that you're worshiping. You may have an idol that you're worshiping. And so that is why Satan is very crafty because Satan understands this. Whatever you worship owns you and makes you in its image. Whatever you worship owns you and makes you into its image. That's why it's very interesting. Uh, Little rabbit trail. Uh, I have met people who will spend 15 minutes in the Word but listen to like three hours of their favorite program on radio or television. And the more you take that in, whatever that is, if that's entertainment tonight, if that's Netflix binging, if that's Hulu, Hulu, if that's Hulu, um, if that's the conservative pundits, if that's the liberal pundits, if it's the in-between pundits, if it's whatever you're listening to, and you say, you know what? I'm going to listen to four to six to eight hours of this and let it feed my soul, but your soul is not fed by the word of God for a disproportional amount compared to that. What you worship owns you and makes you into its image. And so Satan understands that. And here's what he knows. Disobedient against God and his word is worship of Satan. Disobedience against God and his word is worship of Satan. Because people rarely worship Satan directly. In our country, if you ask people, you know, say, hey, would you come and worship Satan directly? There's a few people that will actually do it. But for the most part, no one is willing. I'm not going to worship the devil. He's evil. I don't worship that. But here it is. But if we're willing to embody Satan's values and live out his ethos of rebellion uh, against God, then this action, even though indirect, is the most common form of worshiping him. When we say to God, you know what, God, I know you're calling me to not participate in this particular sin at this moment, but I want to do what I want to do, so I'm going to do it. That disobedience to God becomes worship of Satan. And that's all Satan needed Jesus to do. Look, if I can get you to just break this one commandment, he knew he would own him. Now think about that. The king of kings and the Lord of lords under the authority of Satan. Jesus knew better. That's why he answered the way he answered. So here's the thing. Satan desires our worship. So here's the question. As Christians both corporately and personally, how do we compromise or render to Satan in exchange for the splendor of this world? What are the things that we give up? What are the things we say, you know, Lord, I love you, but I don't love you enough to put this away. I don't love you enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stash this away, Lord. I, I, I just can't. I got to have it, God. I got to have it. And if I got to keep it in secret, I'll keep it in secret. That is the great seduction that Satan loves to use. How many heard of this movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? I'm dating myself. Yes, it's all right. So many of you have not. So you have young children. This is a movie you need to go out. Bring your family together and watch this movie. In 1939, 1939, 
That's a little ways back, not too far back, but a little ways back. 1939, they made this movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And what's funny is when you watch this movie, you're going to see parallels of what our society looks like today. In 1939, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is a movie about a, a, a nice gentleman that did Boy Scouts and helped kids and was great in his community and was an upstanding person with integrity and had Boy Scout values. And the senator died. Uh, in Washington, so the governor wanted to appoint someone who could be a flunky. They can kind of control and manipulate, doesn't really know what's going on in Washington, and they can keep doing the stuff they wanted to do. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. He finds out kind of the corruption that's happening in United States Congress. He finds out the corruption that's happening, and he decides to stand up against it. And when he decides to stand up against it, uh, the person who was one of the big lobbyists and was really rich and owned a lot of media and corporations and other things invited him in and offered him a deal and said, hey, look, if you just play ball, I'll make you one of the greatest senators of all time. And he says, the person that you admire, you know that, that, that politician you really admire? I made that deal with him, you know, many years ago. That's why he's been so successful. Mr. Smith says, you're a liar and walks out. Then he goes to the politician and finds out the politician indeed took that deal. And he says, well, I'm going to stand up and fight. And the politician says, I'll crush him in one minute. I have the media so black in him, he won't know what hit him. And just like that, he had to spin in the media and everybody denouncing Mr. Smith as a renegade that was holding up the votes on the floor that would feed the poor and help the... And when you watch it, you go, wow, in 1939, that was happening in our state's capital? That somebody would compromise and make the deal in order to have the kingdoms of this world. Which is why Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus always responded with the word because Jesus understood this. The word wins the battle. Worshiping God wins the war. The word wins the battle. Worshiping God wins the war. Because every fight is a fight about what's going to be worshiped. The first rebellion was about who's going to be worshiped. Man's rebellion was about I want to be like God. I want to overthrow God. Who's going to be worshiped? All this fight is about worship, which is why Satan comes to him and says, look, just give me a little worship. You give me a little worship, I can hook you up with everything. And Satan is going to tempt us with that, which is why worship for us as a community becomes incredibly important. It's not just about the songs, and it's not just about, you know, uh, whether or not we take communion or whether or not there's a pulpit or whether or not, you know, I wear vestments or casual clothes. None of that is the worship piece. The worship piece is, are we going to be in full submission and obedience to God? That God is going to be our source because whoever is your source determines what kingdom you are a part of. Whatever is your source determines what kingdom you're going to be a part of. Which is why when you have that conversation with Pilate and Jesus, Pilate asks him, are you a king of the Jews? And Jesus says, is that your idea or somebody told you about that? He's like, look, I just want to know. And Jesus makes it very clear. My kingdom is not of this world. If we're part of God's kingdom, our cultural values, the way we live, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we carry ourselves, the way we interact should look more great commandment than it looks like some television pundit. In other words, we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and we love our neighbors as ourselves with an agape love. Because Jesus' kingdom does not have the same motivations and agenda as Satan's kingdom. Satan's kingdom is about power, coercion, how can I control you, how can I get you to on my side, and people seek the money, they seek the fame, they'll sell themselves out, they'll sell their brothers and sisters out, and so that's why you see in our country what we see is that even when we have everything, we still complain. Even when we have everything, by nature, we'll still complain. And we'll say, there is something else I am missing, even though God has blessed us richly. So reflection question number three is simply this. Jesus' kingdom differs from Satan's kingdom. So what are the characteristics of government, cultures, and systems that reflect the kingdom of God? 
versus the ones that reflect the kingdom of Satan. And if you're able to answer that question, you will start to be able to discern whether it's, again, politics, social issues, how you live your life, how you do your family, how you interact with your neighbor. All of that becomes abundantly clear. But then in Mark chapter 12, we saw that Jesus got this question about the coin. And his answer was simply this. Whose image is on the coin? It says Caesar's. He said, well, render unto Caesar's who is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. And the catch to that was that we bear the image of God. So we're supposed to surrender ourselves completely to God the way we surrender the coin that has Caesar's image to the government. Which is why point number six is we have to keep images with their appropriate creators. We bear the image of God. Anytime we don't bear the image of God, being created in the image of God, we live in disobedience to God. Guess who team we're playing for at that point? There's only two squads. It's not Team Jacob or Team Edward. Yeah, some of you got that, huh? Huh? Yeah, I know what you've been watching. You can explain it to the other people who are not as cool later. But you have to know which team you're playing for. You have to know whose jersey you wear. And so we have to answer this question as Christians, corporately and personally, how do we discern the things in our lives that we should render unto Caesar, which we give back to the world, and what we should render unto God? Here's a clue. We're made in the image of God, so we should be giving ourselves totally to God. As I get prepared to close, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. You're already in Luke chapter 4. I want you to jump down to verse 18. And here's what I want you to think about. I'm going to read off some things. When Jesus came on the scene, um, and at this time I'm going to invite the worship team back up. When Jesus came on the scene, Jesus said, here's my mission, here's my vision, here's my goals. This is the things I want to do. And when he did that, a percentage, um, there's some things he laid out. Here's what I want you to think about. I'm going to read out the things that Jesus said that he wanted to do, that he was called to do. And I want you to think about what percentage of the church's attention goes towards those things. And then even more so, since we're around political election time, I want you to think about which political party's platform has this as their primary issue. So I'm going to start reading here. In verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me. What percentage of the church focuses on that? Our attention focuses on that, but more so, which political party is saying, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon us, and we should put the spirit of the Lord upon the nation. Because he has anointed me. Which political party has said, because we are anointed, and we're calling the nation to be consecrated and anointed. To proclaim good news to the poor. How much of our attention as a church is proclaiming the good news to the poor? And which political party says, you know what? What we stand on is we're going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom of the prisoners. Which ones are doing that? And recovery of sight to the blind. Which ones are doing that? If the answer that you got at the end of your quiz was none of them, you got 100%. Because they don't represent the kingdom of God. Now, do we have to be practical about who we vote for and and concerned with our concerns and all of that? Absolutely. But the minute we try to say that one or the other or somebody else represents the kingdom of God. Just remember, we're walking on very thin ice and we may be actually in the other team's kingdom. Amen? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Lord, teach us to serve the kingdom of God. Teach us to be in the kingdom of God. Teach us to be team Jesus. Always. And no matter what we do, no matter what we go, that we live differently, that we represent differently that people look at us and say there's something different about you, Lord. 
Give us wisdom how to navigate this world and the choices we make and the things we do that every choice we make honors and glorifies you. Because always and forever, we want to be Team Jesus. In your holy name we pray, amen. Please stand and sing with us. this Sunday, I invite you to grab hold of your elements. And if you were unable to get one, just raise your hands and our ushers will bring it over to you. So as we stand at the foot of the cross and remember what Jesus Christ has done for us, we take our elements. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it 
saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat, do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he said, this is the blood. The blood of the new covenant shed for you. As often as you drink, do so in remembrance of me. For when you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of our Savior, Lord, that gives us a right to be reconnected to you, God. And Lord, let us become broken bread for the world who is lost, for those who don't know Jesus. Help us just reconnect them to you, Lord as we become your hands and feet in a world that is lost and broken, bringing people into your kingdom. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. You may have your seats. For those of you who are wondering why I switched in my, to my Superman costume, today we have a baby dedication. So at this time, I'm going to invite Ben and Ashley Vegan to the front. Hi, how are you? Long time no see. Good to see you again, my friend. <laughs> All right. Do we have a microphone? See? Thank you. <laughs> All right. So for the folks who don't know you, if you can just introduce us all to who you are and who's all up here. Want me to do everyone? You can do them all. I trust you. <laughs> all right. This is my wife, Ashley Vegan, our daughter, Addison Vegan. This is my wife's sister, Jennifer. And that is Gina Fola. All right. And you are? Ben. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the scripture says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your heads and bind them to your foreheads. Teach them to your children talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord your God has sworn to give your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. And more so it says, Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Calvary family, it is my great joy to introduce to you uh, our newest member of the church. <laughs> this is Addie, and their parents are going to be dedicating their daughter to the Lord this morning. And so they have come to pledge themselves before God and to you as a congregation in a way that honors the Lord. So I'm going to be asking them some questions that will affirm their commitment to both Addie as a young believer that they need to raise up and that's also as their commitment as parents to the Lord as well. Uh, so do you today recognize Addie as a gift of God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessings? If so, say we do. We do. Do you now dedicate Addie to the Lord and give her to the Lord completely, surrendering all worldly claims upon her life in the hope that she will belong wholly to God. We do. Do you pledge as parents that as God's fatherly help, you will bring up Addie in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord into her life? We do. Do you promise to provide through God's blessing for the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs of Addie, looking to your own Heavenly Father for the wisdom, love, and strength 
to serve her and not use her? We do. Do you promise with God's help to make your regular prayer that by God's grace that Addie will come to trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of her sins? We do. With that, we're going to anoint Addie as con consecrating her to the Lord. So, Addie, we consecrate you and dedicate you to the Lord in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you all mind, just extend your hands in prayer and let's pray for Addie and for the vegan family. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we give Addie to you, God. We ask that you bless her and that you consecrate her, Lord, that even now your Holy Spirit is already deep into her soul and in her heart, Lord, that she has a fire burning in her like was within John the Baptist, Lord, that even at this age she recognized that you are Lord. Lord, we ask that you give wisdom and insight and a passion for Ashley and Ben to raise her in your ways and a dedication to know, dedication for her to know that you are the Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray, amen. All right, give him a round of applause. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. If you guys wanted to stay, so you want to take some pictures afterwards, or are you doing anything like that? Okay. All right. We'll let you stay up here. I'm going to give the benediction. And do we have anyone doing altar prayer this week? We're going to ask the altar prayer folks to, to be over here. And to, if you desire prayer, you can come up and have our prayer team pray with you. Uh, and again, this is a way for us to, again, to start to break down those strongholds in lives of people who are suffering in, fight, uh, in silence and to remind us that the battle indeed belong to the Lord. Uh, so may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. And the church said, amen. All right, go in peace and have a Jesus-filled day.